We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. When you look at the songs that are throughout Scripture, the Psalms and then uh, victory chants that we run into after some battles, what gender do you normally think of when you think of the songs that are written and recorded in Scripture? Men, right? Predominantly, they are. But there are a few songs that are in Scripture that were written by women. Some of them were sung by women's choruses even. Uh, Miriam and her group of women sang after they came across the Red Sea. They wrote a song and sang. Uh, you run into uh, uh, Elizabeth, mother of John the Baptist, has a song that she sings or that she records about how God was good to her. So there are a few of them. And Hannah is one of those that has a song recorded in scripture uh, it's listed as a prayer but it comes across as like one of the psalms okay. so we're going to read beginning in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verses 1 through 10 so Hannah prayed and said my heart rejoices in the Lord in the Lord my, home, my horn is lifted up my mouth boasts over my enemies for I delight in your deliverance there is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The, bows of the bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and he raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with the princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed one. So you can tell, I mean, when we think about a prayer, this doesn't sound like a prayer, does it? It sounds more like poetry, more like a song. So she is one of those few who has something uh, like this in Scripture. Did you notice some of the things that she brings up sound like they're very personal to her? Like in verse 3, Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. Do you think she had Panina in mind when she was talking about that? Panina, the one with all the kids who would make her feel so lowly before she was the mother of Samuel. You go on down and uh, uh, let's see. Uh, the one who was barren has borne seven children, but the one who had many sons is pining away. <laughs> so uh, I think maybe that her celebration over being the mother of Samuel is a little transparent at points. But she's just saying, God can do anything. There's nothing that God can, uh, that can be left undone if God's in on it. Look over at Luke chapter 1. We're going to compare uh, our passages to Luke a couple of times tonight. Luke chapter 1, verse 46. This time it's Mary who's writing the song. Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. 
He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Does that sound familiar? It's the same kind of feeling that you see in Hannah's prayer. I'm, I was a nobody. I was uh, kind of on the outside of life looking in, and now all of a sudden I've become important. I've got something that I can do to make a contribution to the greater good. And at the point where Hannah is in, in her prayer, she doesn't really know all that Samuel is going to do. It's going to be unbelievable, the things that Samuel accomplishes. And at Mary's time, when she's praying, she knows that the Holy Spirit is going to be on her and she's going to be with child. But how does she know what that child will really become? All of her life, it says things like she stored these things up in her heart. She was always looking and watching and wondering exactly what it was that God was going to do. And I mean, in the end, it was a horrible thing for her to have to go through for her own son to go to the cross. But she made a contribution to all of humanity for all time. And Hannah made a contribution to all of Israel for all time. Samuel is a very, very special individual. All right, let's go to chapter 2 and verse 12. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. Before we get to what Samuel does, we have to find out that things are not as good as they should be as far as the spiritual life of the children of Israel is concerned. And it's not their fault this time. We've seen them worshiping idols, right? So we could blame that on them. They, they made that choice. But even those who were worshiping Yahweh, those who were worshiping the one true God, were getting cheated when they came to the tabernacle to worship. And it's because of Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, that things begin to kind of unravel in Eli's family. So beginning in chapter 2, verse 12, Eli's sons were scoundrels. That's the NIV word. It's a good word. They had no regard for the Lord. Now it was the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand while the meat was being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And whatever the fork brought up, then the priest would take that for himself. This is how they treated all of the Israelites who came to Shiloh. But even before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was doing the sacrificing, give the priest some of the meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, only raw. Now, the portions of fat that he's talking about were holy. They were things that were to be sacrificed on the altar so that that sweet smell would rise up before the Lord. And being a barbecue lover as I am, I love the sweet smell of, of fat on the grill, right? So they would come in before. It was their right to dip in and to get some of the boiled meat. But it was not their right to get some of the fat that was holy to the Lord. It was not their right to get the meat pre-cooked. And so they have the their servant go and basically shake down the people when they come to make their sacrifice. Uh, you're, at a, you're at a disadvantage when you're someone who has come to a holy place and the holy people, so-called, are telling you what to do and they're breaking all the rules so that they can have something better from you than they actually deserved. So if the person says to him, let the fat be burned first and then take whatever you want, the servant would answer, no, hand it over now, and if you don't, I'll take it by force. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. So it's not just about the way they treated the people. 
they were extorting things from people who were coming to Shiloh to worship. But it was about the sacrifices that were meant for God. So let's say you or I are the sacrificers and we show up at Shiloh with our gift and we prepare our gift and we're having this moment, right? We're, we're making our sacrifice and we're going to be united with our Father and we're going to find forgiveness and, and it's a very big deal in our life. And then a guy shows up and says, no, we're not waiting for it to be in the boiling pot. We're taking our cut now and you give it to me or you're going to have a problem. So we have that kind of shakedown going on in the tabernacle of the Lord. Now compare beginning in verse 18, we get a description of who Samuel was. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. An ephod is like an apron. And for a for a person to wear a linen ephod would identify them as being part of the priestly staff. So the guys who should have been doing it right were extorting the people, but Samuel was wearing a linen ephod, and he was helping people. Uh, each year his mother made for him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So when we're little kids and we study about Samuel, we kind of skip over most of this. We get to that part where he hears the voice of God. Right? Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. We, that's the part that we remember from Sunday school. But there is a drastic problem going on in the spiritual life of the people of Israel. And Samuel is kind of thrust into the middle of this thing. Eli has sons who are cheating the people, and unfortunately, Eli has no way of controlling them. He's not doing anything to fix the problem. Skip over to verse 26. The boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord, and with people. Does that sound familiar at all? In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and the boy grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Who's that talking about? That's Jesus, right? So Samuel kind of sets the precedent and then when they're describing Jesus, they use words that are almost the same that were used to describe young Samuel. And to people around him, that would have been a tremendous tribute to Jesus. Now, when we look back at it, we think, well, that was a tremendous tribute to Samuel. Uh, but Jesus is Jesus and Samuel is Samuel. But he is a, he's a young man doing all the right things. So he is serving the people he is wearing a linen ephod, so he's beginning at a young age to serve in the tabernacle to be useful to the Lord. All right. um, let me see where I want to be. Go down to verse 22. Uh, chapter 2, verse 22. Eli, who was very old heard about everything his sons were doing to all of Israel and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So here's a group that you probably haven't thought about before. Uh, there were women who were a little bit like Samuel in that they were given by their families to serve at the tabernacle. They were doorkeepers. They were greeters. They were people that made sure that you got where you needed to be and you got connected with the people that you needed to see. And so the, they were a holy group. Uh, I guess in our generation we would think nuns, right? They, they're dedicated to the temple. They're living at the temple, serving at the temple, and Hophni and Phinehas are taking advantage of them, right? Their proximity and their availability are a little too much for Hophni and Phinehas, and so they are sleeping with the women 
who served at the entrance to the tent of meeting. So he said to them, Why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about these wicked deeds of yours. No, my sons, the report I, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. So the boys are beyond the point of no return. They're not listening anymore. They're not paying attention to the law of the Lord. They're not paying attention to their dad. Uh, they are too far gone. The Lord already knows this. He sees what's on the horizon. So before we get to Samuel's call, we have another unidentified guy who shows up to bring a prophecy to Eli. Right? And again, in Bible class, we don't get this guy. We kind of we skip over him. But look at verse 27, chapter 2, verse 27. Now a man of God came to Eli. We don't get a name for this guy. He's just a man of God. We know all about Samuel. We get a life history on Samuel. But this guy who showed up to talk to Eli, we don't have a name for him. He said to Eli, this is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. Why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribed for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promised that members of your family would minister before me forever, but now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me I will honor but those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. You will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of their life. So there's the message. Right? This guy shows up and he tells Eli, you know what they're doing and you're not stopping it. So God is holding you responsible. Your lineage has been serving in the tabernacle for all these years. And God said it would always be that way. But you've ruined that. You messed it up so bad that God can't keep the promise that he made because your family has become so corrupt, now he's going to have to change and move in a different direction and your family is going to bear the brunt of the punishment because they don't listen. And so here's poor Eli, you know, what's he going to do? Uh, it's, it's too late to change, it's too late to undo what has been done. And so he is stuck. All right, verse 34, what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be assigned to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and my mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. Then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread, and you will plead Appoint me to some priestly office so that I can at least have some food to eat. So the lineage of Eli is going to go from top of the heap to the very bottom. God says, I'm going to do so, do so much to your family that in the future they're going to have to come and beg for help. They're still of the tribe of Levi, right? so they don't own land. They don't have a place other than to be in service to the Lord. So at some point he says, you guys are going to have to beg from whoever I put in here if you just want a job where you can eat. But I've had all I want of you, and I'm removing you from the leadership. 
Uh, let's put a comma right there, and we will talk about God's call of Samuel next week, but I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a precursor. We've had one prophet come already and give Eli this news. In the Jewish mindset, you need two witnesses. Samuel is the second witness. So when we talk about his call next week, we'll talk a little bit about prophecy in general and a little bit about how horrible it was to be a young man named Samuel when God called you to be his spokesman. So Lord willing, we'll get to that next week. Tell you guys bye.